On this episode, we're gonna be covering rescue puppies and when to start them on certain tools, working with fear aggression with a dog where fight is his only option, what to correct and what not to correct with that, uh, building trust at a veterinarian's office with a dog that cannot be touched or even go near without lunging, biting, etc., and much, much more on episode 16 of Dog Behavior Question Tuesday. What's up guys, this is Blake with Dream Come True Canine and this is episode 16 of Dog Behavior Question Tuesday. Um, second week back, of course we're late, today is Wednesday. We will have the episode up by this evening. Um, we're gonna jump right into it. Not a lot of questions, I think we have five. One cool thing, if you guys follow our Periscope page as well as our Instagram and Facebook, you will see a couple of things that are a very big deal. Um, we recently, did a Periscope session on Bolt, the French Bulldog, just kind of debunking all the silly myths that Frenchies can't be trained. Uh, he was known and, and given the name the Gremlin by his owners because he was just out of control around other dogs and uh, just a massive puller on the leash. He is being a rock star. Maya, who's actually sleeping with him uh, on that placemat, um, was the dog in like episode nine or eight that was like an anxious wreck. You can see she's chilling out. She comes and hangs out here for just to kind of keep training going. We have the two little dogs, Phoebe and Darcy. If you guys followed one of the Facebook videos, you got to see the day they first arrived. This one was on a muzzle, barking nonstop, along with uh, this one as well. I couldn't even have like a conversation um, with the owners to go over things and the trainer that they had with them. Um, because it was, just, it was just out of control. They were massive pullers as well. And then some of our more recent guys, we have um, Rasta Monsta or Rasta Pasta and uh, Lola. This was the girl from the Periscope session that everybody was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Like this, this girl's out of control. You saw us getting her out of the crate. It was like a 30 minute video, live, raw, unedited footage. And then this guy here. So, Two nervous dogs, two very anxious dogs, nervous, anxious, anxious, bratty gremlin, and then there's uh, Soko, Roe, and uh, Samson over in the corner. We have a couple other dogs downstairs, but this is kind of where we are right now. We're at the point where they need to benefit from this. So what you will notice from this episode compared to like last episode and some of the others is that we, um, <laughs> we, um, started this episode with the dogs in place. And one of the main reasons for that is there are four dogs here, specifically two that are not ready for that social environment then being recalled and being placed. So because we understand where they are, um, this is what they benefit from, just being around dogs and just coexisting. This right now is the, the level of socialization that they're at. Um, so we want them to be successful, and that's pretty much why we started the episode this way, right? Um, before you know it, these guys will probably be socializing, um, or we might even start the episode off where they're wandering around, and then I go ahead and place them, but they're not there yet, right? Um, but they have come a long way, right? So we're gonna jump right into this. Uh, first uh, question is from Geektard. Uh, it's good to see that you're still, you're still kind of engaging, getting involved here. Uh, first of all, thank you for your answer on your latest video. It was really helpful, and my Roddy is already better. My question is, how do I, that's awesome to hear, by the way. My question is, how do I calm him down uh, when he almost runs while on heel command, like a nervous horse? Uh, should I stop and wait until he calms down or continue correcting him while walking? You know, it's interesting. Um, I don't normally read through the questions prior, um, at least I try to, so that I can be like, on this episode, but it never really pans out. We actually just finished reading through some of these, and the first thing that I did when I saw that question was I asked the guy behind the camera, Andrew, what he would suggest, and um, when we're looking at this, if you have to keep correcting over and over, you might be actually um, sending mixed messages, because usually when you're working on a heel, you're, you're using a lot of food, 
and you're, you're, you're shaping or free shaping to create certain positions and stuff. And uh, you might be creating way too, ex too much excitement in a way where it's not building focus and teaching a dog what to do. So instead of moving forward on like that movement, understand or teach a dog what to do, how to get a position, how to hold eye contact and get movement for that and really slow it down a little bit. Um, or not movement, but get focus on that, have them realize that this focus calm is what's getting them fed and then move forward. That way you can control excitement without that actually ruining uh, what you're doing. You might be moving a little bit too quickly. Um, did you have anything to add for that? Um, yeah, so uh, maybe use something uh, maybe to motivate food or a toy to get engagement and to get focus and then down the line it's like you don't really need that stuff to do. Using that motor, you can, the dog knows what to do. Okay. Okay. Okay, so Andrew was just saying in the beginning he would, he would use whatever motivates that dog to create what it is that you want. And once it, it's kind of known, you can take those, those uh, positive reinforcement things away because the dog already knows what to do. And that should help to kind of level a dog where you can maybe give it to them at the end. So they realize like creating focus is what's gonna get them the big payoff instead of them only working like so much for the big payoff. So teach what it is that you want. Use that food to create that and then fade away from it so your dog's not just doing it like going like gaga for that fix, right? Um, so that, that would be my answer for that. Uh, next question is from Casey. What's up, Kim? It's good to see you. Um, hey, Blake. So I work at a vet's office, and I had a client come in who has been here several times, and we never had a problem. The dog went to a different hospital and had a terrible experience. Now the dog doesn't even allow us to go near him without lunging and trying to bite. My question is, how can we build his trust back uh, to be able to complete services. Okay, this is actually a great question and it's something that puts you guys in a tough position just the same as like groomers when they're trying to give a dog a bath or a groom. So what I would say is um, you need to talk to the owners because this is not really something that is fair for you guys to try to do and start off, but what I would do with the owners is I would, if, if they came to me, we would do a lot of counter conditioning with food and getting a dog to realize that being touched for food and getting a yes and stuff is, is how they kind of work through that, right? Um, let me actually put this away. Let me make sure I'm recording and then I'm gonna down this dog here. I am recording. Yeah. Good job. Um, all right, she's finally starting to relax a little, a little bit more. She's getting there. Um, so that's, that's what I would do. I actually, the first client that comes to mind is a dog, Bucky, that we still work with that like, he's a, what is Bucky, a Labradoodle or? Uh, he's some, some sort of, of poodle doodle, I, I, I don't know. Um, but um, we did a lot of that with Bucky. This is a dog that like lived his life early on where wherever there was like unsurety or he didn't want to do something, he protested and everything would always stop. Right, and, and the protest started very, very light. It was super like, is, is minuscule the right word? I don't know why I'm trying to be like fancy with these words, but it was super minuscule if that's the right word. If it's not, you, you guys know what I'm trying to say, right? Um, but uh, it would be like a paw pulling away or trying to do this, pulling away, and they would always stop going to the groomers to get a bath or something, uh, you know, pulling away, oh, it's okay, you know, and, and all that. And over time, what ended up happening is a dog realized that when he didn't want something, he could just do that and it worked. And then eventually it escalated to a growl. Oh, we don't do, well we can start later or we can try something else. Over time it ended up being a snap and then a dog that literally couldn't be touched to the point where like, you know, the owner was even afraid, had been sent to the ER and stuff like that. So when you're dealing with that type of dog, the dog needs to be pushed, but you can't push a dog that can't be touched, right? So I don't mean literally like push a dog, it's really hard. So you gotta go down to foundation and then you need to, you need to have an in on something that they need. Your in is gonna be food, or the client's in is gonna be food. Stop free feeding the dog, stop giving the dog two bowls a day. Food only comes from the hands, and they learn how to be touched for the human, or for the owner, which is probably easy for them, but you do that so that they get used to working for food. Once that's really solid, then you can start to up the ante a little. This has to be done safely. I can't give you an exact how-to for here, but basically, the dog is used to that, and then the dog has solid recall, all of a sudden the dog knows that it's getting food. Let's say I'm the stranger, my hand is over here, the client can, this is when the dog's ready, right? Bring the dog over, 
They're not doing this to try to give the nervous dog food. The dog takes it, good job, recall, gets more food and goes back to place or something. And you slowly start to build a dog that learns to tolerate stuff. So what we did with Bucky is we would do scissors. We got him really solid with working for food, knowing that if he put up with some things, he would get the food and it actually ended um, when he held out rather than when he said, okay, that's too much and actually snapped. So we slowly started building the increments and the duration and like just recently I took him to get groomed and we went through an entire groom session where there was only like one little issue where I said nope and gave a correction and that was it. Um, and this is a dog that like couldn't be touched. He got bathed and then got groomed and this is a dog that like looked like a lamb. So I'm talking like, it, it's like a two to three hour session, right? Um, and he freaking rocked it, he aced it out of the park. So that's basically what you gotta do but that's a slow process and the owner's gotta get involved otherwise it's not really fair to you guys, right? Um, and it's super risky. So going into high five for canines, what's up? Uh, hey Blake, glad to see you guys back with the DBQ uh, Tuesday episodes. My question this week is, if you were working with a dog who is fear aggressive to the point of choosing fight as his only option, would you reward and encourage him when he voluntarily chooses to turn away from tense situations instead? This is a good question. Um, why I ask is because giving distance is a, ch -ch -ch, hey, down. Good. Giving distance, where are we? Uh, why I ask is because giving distance is a great step, but it doesn't seem realistic in the long run for full rehab when eventually flight is not an option either. Uh, hope that makes sense. This makes perfect sense, and you're actually, um, you're, you're a little bit ahead of the game of what you're thinking. So, there's a couple of things. When you're dealing with fear aggression and fight is the dog's only option, it's their only option because it's the only option that they know. And more often than not, it's other options that they tried have proven to be unsuccessful, right? So when you're looking at that in the beginning, you have to teach that other options are even an option that the dog can choose, right? So in the beginning, I will reward for a dog understanding that now this cameraman is getting closer and I'm over here and instead of normally lashing out, this is pretty much what we did with this girl, instead of normally like lashing out, you understand that you can walk away, right? And understanding that that's an option, you start to choose that before going so extreme and you get that really, really solid so that as an owner, I can see a cutoff cue when my dog is nervous and I can intervene and I can do something so that that dog doesn't have to, right? So this is like, I'm summing it up, I'm trying to like do it quickly like in a nutshell. Um, at some point though, once a dog knows other options and is choosing to do something else or choose to do something else, now I can correct and I can correct harshly for a couple of reasons. One, by the time I get to this point, more often than not the dog already knows what I'm asking. The dog already knows I made it clear that I don't want that to ever be an option. Don't do that again for a couple of reasons. One, you could really injure somebody and two, you could actually lose your life over making that choice. And this is an important one. A lot of people don't realize, like, oh, well, you correct the dog. It's like, you're damn right I did because my correction is way less harsh than what nature's correction would have been if she bites the wrong person or if, if that dog bites the wrong dog or something like that. Like, they don't care that the dog is fear aggressive. They don't care that the dog is a rescue from Louisiana flood and was scared of water and you had a water bottle in your hand when you reached to bite. Like, all that nonsense doesn't matter. The wrong bite with the wrong person, done. Right? So I'm gonna correct to let that option be known. Don't ever do that again, but before I do, I wanna really build a relationship, be solid, and have that dog realize, oh, you don't want me doing that? Well, what do I do in that situation? Then we also have to look at advocating for the dog where we're not putting them in situations where that can happen, but in worst case scenarios, we can create something else. We can create a dog that avoids. We can create a dog that will run behind you or, or do something else as a primary versus what that dog's default is now. That dog's default is absolutely not, not allowed. Even if that means when I correct it, you're scared to make that choice, good. Don't ever make that choice again. Be, be uh, have the impulse to wanna do it and then go, ooh, last time, man, what do I do? Maybe I should do this, and then I'm gonna reward the heck out of it because I want you doing that, I don't want you doing this, right? So it, it's a little bit of a tricky process. Again, there's no exact how-to because that could be dangerous. Every dog varies, and like the stuff that I'm good at, the stuff that I can really point out is kind of in the moment, and I really can't do that now. Um, but uh, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, I'm really glad that, that you asked that. Okay, uh, Kitala. 
Hi, it's the Foster Mama again. Our rescue works with puppies, so this question is for all of us with young puppies. Should we start them with prong collars or start with flat and introduce the prong collar at a certain age, or does it depend on responsiveness to a dog? If you say responsiveness of a dog, what indicators do you use to move up to the prong, given that puppies don't always immediately yield to a flat collar? This is another great question. Um, first off, what would be awesome to know is, hey, Andrew, bust out your phone real quick and see if you can see where she's from. Um, I'm, I'm gonna give you the short, the, the short and sweet answer. Um, puppies, we don't like to start on prong collars right away. Um, not because the prong collar is a bad tool, it's just you kind of want to let the dog be a dog, usually around like the four or five month mark. Um, four to six, I'd say, that's when it's ideal to get them on a, on a, a prong collar. Um, in the beginning, I would even say, you don't want to use a front clip harness, but you can use a back clip harness and kind of put up with the dog being a pup and doing all those things and really work on a lot of positive reinforcement stuff, let the dog be a little bit of a nut and a goof. And uh, once they hit that five month mark um, or four, four to six month mark, that's when you can put it on and that makes more sense. Um, flat buckle collars, I'm not a huge fan of. If anything, I might use a slip lead away from like situations where I need to use it. That's kind of what we did with, uh, with Willie, where it was like we didn't have, we put him on a slip lead and we used a lot of food to shape where we wanted him to be. Like this is an awesome area, not that, not this. And anytime we use food, we would use a little bit of pressure, just like subtle pressure because he was gonna make the choice for the food anyway. So what ended up happening was um, the dog learned the basics of the pressure and then when we jumped him up to like a prong, I don't even think we did actually when he went home. Yeah, and we did, like the dog already was super soft with it. So like we didn't put up with a puppy doing it and having that puppy nonsense and feeling that because you can't really do much um, and you don't want to desensitize a dog to that feeling until they really know what the pressure is. So uh, that would be my answer. If you're going to use a harness and kind of put up with that stuff, a back clip harness is going to be much, much safer than those front clip harnesses that will, and, and, and more often than not, if you have like a massive puller, can cause like irreplaceable or not irreplaceable, but unrepairable damage to this area. And any chiropractor um, that works with dogs for a long time will, will be honest about that and, and, and let you know the truth about those, regardless of how they're marketed, right? I would say um, for that question, it's almost like um, a because question in a way. Um, with puppies, you can control your environment and, and support you can like positive punishment and negative reinforcement. You, you try to use negative punishment and control your environment as much as yeah, that's, that's a really good point. So Andrew, Andrew also says, you know, when you're working with puppies, um, you want to try to control your environment in the beginning as much as you can. Um, and really, if you're looking at operant conditioning, the four quadrants, you, you kind of want to stay more in the realm of, um, of positive reinforcement and negative punishment, basically withholding something. And it's the thing, if you start a dog off with an earning lifestyle, withholding something, like food until they make a right choice or something else can actually be pretty strong and effective, especially in early stages when you're not really dealing with a lot of competing motivators. When you get to competing motivators, once that foundation is set in place, then you can start getting into the other stuff because like you've already kind of built the blocks where that stuff is gonna be clear and actually effective. And that's when we start getting into more real world stuff. Um, especially if you like live in New York City, but you do want to kind of work in a sterile environment with some puppies in the beginning and kind of keep things simple. All right. Um, I think this is actually probably the shortest DBQ Tuesday episode on record in history. Um, we're going to get these going. So let's get the questions going. This episode will be up tonight and uh, probably on Friday or Saturday, I'm going to post on our Instagram page, ask your question here, which reminds me, can you take a picture with your phone? That way we'll kind of we'll kind of get this, and I'll even point up here if you can get that. I'm pointing because I'm that's where I'm gonna write. Ask your question here. You're gonna have me freeze frame this. All right, cool. Um, around Friday or Saturday, that's where you guys can ask your question on Instagram. If you know people that will benefit from this, I don't even care if they don't have an Instagram channel. Have them make an Instagram channel to follow us and just ask the question. I don't care if they post anything on it. If, if this is like something that could be valuable to a friend or a neighbor, like free information that they don't have to pay for, like spread the word, you know what I mean? Um, that is pretty much it. I will see you guys next week for episode 17. Later.